Hi, I'm Martin Sibley, a community leader at Open Inclusion. Welcome to our podcast series, Inclusive Design, Broader Perspectives for Better Experiences. Also available as a caption podcast on Open Inclusion's YouTube channel. Open Inclusion is a research, user insight, design and innovation consultancy based in London, England. We help organizations create beautifully inclusive and effective experiences. If you would like to know more about the work we do or would like to contact us, please visit openinclusion.com. We would love to hear from you. In this podcast series, we're interviewing a wide range of people who help us better understand inclusion, both from a user and a service provider perspective. Now this is episode number two of a double bill all about Valuable 500. So hopefully you've seen the first one with the amazing Dr. Caroline Casey talking about Valuable 500 and how through her journey she came to launch it and all of the many big reasons that big businesses should be signing up from from the top level of CEOs and, and board members. So that was a really amazing interview with her. And then today we're going to be chatting to Marianne Waite, who is the campaign director and we're going to be really focusing on the importance of brand and how many businesses um, unwittingly are excluding a lot of people through their branding. And also, look, obviously, look at the problem of that, but really looking at the opportunities that are out there for businesses that are able to have inclusive and far reaching brands. So it's going to be a really nice conversation with Marianne and all of her involvement on the Valuable 500. And then, last but not least, we're going to be chatting to Christine Hemphill from Open, from Open itself, and looking at the customer model and how Open are going to be helping the Valuable 500 partners, along with other partners as well, of course, but particularly how Open is going to help with the customer model and the four parts that make up that. So I'm really excited to learn more from Christine about Open's involvement. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey guys, it's Martin Sibley here from the latest episode of the Open Inclusion podcast. And I'm joined by Marianne Waite. So thank you for joining me today, Marianne. Hi, absolute pleasure. I love the background. It's so cool. Very funky, isn't it? Have you just painted it in prep for the, uh, the interview? I'll just do you a quick mural. Very, very good preparation <laughs> and dedication there. Yeah, fit in. <laughs> very welcome. <laughs> so obviously everyone knows that um, we're following on from the interview with Caroline in the previous episode, looking at Valuable 500. So it makes sense to, to kind of pick up where we left off and just for you to give a little bit more about, I suppose, how you got to know about Valuable 500 and also what your particular role is is in there as well. Does that sound like a good start? It sounds like a great start. Um, So I suppose depending on how, you're going to regret asking that because I'll go back way too far now. No, no, it's all good. But I have got extensive experience in exclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a sister who has cerebral palsy and growing up with Cara meant that at every turn we experienced exclusion as a family mm-hmm. on her behalf, on our behalf, walking down the street, the looks you get, the uh, fact that you can't ever find clothes or products that are suitable for her, um, trying to get people to take note in terms of service provision and really trying to push forward with whatever her needs were. It's been a lifetime of trying to fight against the grain. And when you grow up in that sort of a circumstance, it's easy to think, well, you know, that's just the way life is. This is just the way life is. If you have a disability or if you care for someone that has a disability, you just got to kind of suck it up and accept that it's always going to be difficult. Um, and I, uh, as I kind of grow, got older, my love of design and art increased and I went on to study um, design and branding at university. And one of my modules was inclusive design. And as part of this course, we learned all around how, um, we learned about how design can be used to enable people to break down barriers. Mm -hmm. And we learned about early adopters. We started to look at this at a brand level. And I kind of thought, oh my gosh, this is really exciting that actually there are means of combating disability and exclusion and why is this so niche at the moment Mm -hmm. so um it was kind of a watershed moment for me thinking that actually the world doesn't have to be the way it is that more can be done to change and improve the lives of of people with disabilities but also older people and people that have got different kind of temporary or situational um disabilities 
and um, I then progressed into a career in the art, in the brand and design world. So I've been working in uh, creative agencies for the last 12 years. And the more I interact with brands and look at how they are starting to tackle social and ec economic problems and environmental problems, the more you realize how much power brands and organizations have to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it with sustainability and environmentalism, Mm -hmm. with gender and diversity in that respect and um, now I think we're sort of starting to see this new wave of, of sustainable growth in the form of inclusion so it's been this great journey of kind of thinking gosh this is the way the world's going to be and that's really unfair to hang on there's a small way of maybe changing this it's such a shame it's so niche to oh my goodness there's a huge big outlet to try and make a difference at scale so um I set up a couple of years ago a thought collective called um, Think Designable, which tried to get agencies and clients within the brand and design world to think about inclusive design at every stage of the development and creative process. Um, and I've been running that for the last three years. And in my full-time role here at, it was at Interbrand, Omnicom, I met Caroline Casey mm -hmm. and we had very similar views on inclusion and, you know, both probably quite nuts. <laughs> and um, that always helps in this world, right? <laughs> exactly. Although it's a good point. I don't even know if you should be saying you have to kind of your language somewhere. Is that the right word? Both very enthusiastic yes. about this. And um, and we and I was lucky enough to, to be involved in some of the early conversations around the Valuable 500 here at Omnicom. And obviously, as Omnicom then started to become a strategic partner and agreed to help um, strategically work with the Valuable 500, I was seconded out of my role full time to work with Caroline. Mm -hmm. So it's a very long answer, but right. it's very yeah. helpful to understand the backstory. Like so well, how would you describe your role now in Valuable 500? Um, so my, my title is Director of Campaign here at the Valuable 500, but the beauty of this role and of the team that we're in is that it varies from everything to creative execution, to working with Caroline on her speaker opportunities, to web development, uh, to um, uh, different events we might be putting on across the world. So it's really, it's really just about kind of trying to make noise um, and getting our message out there so that people are kind of equally as galvanized by what we're trying to do in terms of putting disability on the board leadership agenda. Yeah, no, that sounds brilliant. So I believe there's also some other news around you being um, given the role of a sector champion for brand and design, is that right? That's right, yeah. So when, yeah. Did, when did that happen? Is that quite recent? That was a few weeks ago, I think it would have been about a month ago now. Well, congratulations yeah. on that. That's so kind. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. It's, it's really exciting because Sam Phillips, who is the advertising sector champion for disability, also works within Omnicom. So mm. to have two champions here is really exciting because I'm sure between us, there's plenty we can do. Yeah, no, definitely. And so obviously that just shows everyone, you know, myself interviewing you and all the people watching and listening that there is just this such movement at the moment, this big opportunity around uh, obviously business, but particularly with brand and the fact that there's you know, the government uh, appointing yourself as a sector champion. So, yeah. um, I mean, you, you've sort of touched a little bit on it already, but when you look at brand as an exclusion, as you said, when you were growing up with your sister um, and a disabling um, environment as well, um, and then also the other side of it is the opportunity. So yeah. can you just give a, a couple of little thoughts and examples of how brand can be both bad and good for disabled people? Well, um, I think it's important to kind of note how far we've got to go. So as part of the Valuable 500 launch, we created our diverse film, which highlights all of the different excuses brands give when we ask them how they are being inclusive and that's uh, when they're in inclusive and diverse and as a brand strategist how many times we have clients come to us and say right okay we need to write into our strategy that we are innovative and we are inclusive and we are democratic and i have to say to them okay well great can you just share how you're being inclusive mm -hmm. people with disabilities and how you're weaving this into your research and product development and of course 
they say, oh, well, you know, we're doing really great stuff around LBGTQ, so perhaps we'll look at disability further down the line. So we kind of wanted to highlight the fact that although 90% of companies claim to prioritise diversity, only 4% are thinking about disability, disability mm. in this. So we're so early on in this journey. And the shame of that is that for those brands that don't prioritize or consider disability, they disable by default. Mm -hmm. So 96% of brands are disabling at the moment. And that is obviously not only just a, a social shame and the fact you know, that that's contributing towards this disability inequality crisis. From, from a brand and a business perspective, it's a huge waste and a huge shame as well because you know you think about things like we hear all the time people talking about sustainable growth how do we get more customers how do we better serve our existing customers how do we employ the best talent we hear this all the time and yet these organizations are ignoring 20 percent of the population yeah. who could bring a, you know and, and in a lot of circumstances this is a part of the population who knows a lot about adaptation about innovating about hacking to improve mm -hmm. and problem solving so um yeah. so it, it, you know there's a lot of opportunity and i think we all yeah i probably won't need to bore you with the stats around kind of the, the value of uh, this market opportunity um but from a purely brand perspective when you look at brands that are thinking about inclusion, they are seeing loads of benefits, not, in term, not just in terms of kind of brand value, but also brand reputation, mm -hmm. uh, perception, uh, reduced risk. So, you know, there are so many reasons why that I think a lot of people in this business are starting to answer, well, can you afford not to think about inclusion? Yeah. Um, and when you look at Interbrand's best global brands, some of those highest ranking brands like Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, these are all brands that think about inclusivity and accessibility across everything they do in a really deep way. So much so that it's actually not about disability, but more about user experience and other kind of, you know, sexy words that we hear a lot in our industry that businesses recognize as valuable, but don't necessarily attribute to disability. Yeah, something that you were just saying there, Marianne, that I thought was really interesting was about the diverse -ish videos. And when I mentioned it to, or showed the videos rather to a few friends, they were all convinced that they were real companies in it, which <laughs> I didn't know whether to laugh or cry about, to be honest. Uh, I think that's really telling, though, that people can kind of see that that's what's going on. Um, it's funny because I think Caroline's mother said to her, oh, gosh, what if you get sued? These people are going to you. So we've had to explain to a few people that they're not real. Yeah. The content is very much real. It's very true. The kind of stuff that we keep hearing. Yeah. And the scariest response we hear is when you hear people talk about the fact that it doesn't meet their aspirational brand image, or especially luxury brands will say, oh, well, disability has got nothing to do with us. But hello, you know, disabled people have got disposable incomes too. And, you know, as we get older, we're going to want to kind of uphold certain lifestyles. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that excuse is really redundant and hopefully one day will prove to be shocking. So Elizabeth Jackson, a couple of years ago, tried to get J. Crew to, um, she's a disability campaigner in the US, and she tried to get J. Crew to stock beautiful um, Top and Derby walking canes. And they didn't for that exact reason is that disability wasn't quite in line with their brand. Um, wow. And I hope that that is soon seen as totally shameful behavior. Well, moving a little bit more to, to the future and the last couple of questions before we wrap up. So broad one, as we said earlier, we won't put a number on it, but generally in the future, what do you think success looks like? So I want people to think about and view inclusivity and disability inclusivity in particular with sustainability. So... 25 years ago, sustainability was not even thought about. It was a nice to have. It was nothing to do with business. Thank you very much. That's government's problem. And then we kind of saw it move to a point where it was the remit of CSR teams within organizations and a nice to have again. But now it's an imperative. We've got the sustainability, the sustainable development goals. Um, we've got businesses thinking about this on a deeper level than ever before. We've got social pressure to make sure that we're looking after the environment. And therefore, it, sustainability is woven through every single part of the business from 
you know, uh, what your marketing, what your production service development is like, uh, who you're speaking to in order to inform that, the research you're doing, um, sales and distribution. And that's what we want to see with in, uh, inclusivity as well. We want to make sure that from the top down, from the leadership positions down, people understand that wherever you sit within an organization, you need to be thinking about who you're excluding. Um, and I think that's that's how we'll kind of win and make a difference. I love that vision. That's awesome. So final, final question. If someone's watching or listening to this and they're, they're in a role that, that touches upon marketing or, or brand, what would be a bit of advice that you could get them to either start their journey or maybe just progress a little bit further in their journey to inclusion? Um, it has to be investing in listening to disabled people, mm. old people, and doing decent, decent testing. Um, as Kat Holmes says uh, in her book, Mismatch, she talks about thick data. We always talk about big data, but actually we need to be going deeper to make sure that we're looking at the different levels of users to figure out who we are not speaking to, who we're not able to reach, what areas are. <laughs> I think the dog put that very nicely. <laughs> but yeah, listen and learn from disabled people. Yeah, no, that's a perfect ending. Apologies for the dog, but I think you hit the nail on the head so perfectly there that we will we will leave it. And yeah, I think um, everyone that, that's involved, I think we all kind of know intuitively as well what inclusion looks like. I think Caroline said as well, it's not rocket science. It's just we actually need to start taking real action and commitment to that now. And it's easier than we think. Yeah. It's a big job to do, but slowly but surely. All right. Well, thank you for your time today, Marianne. I really enjoyed chatting with you. You too. Thanks, Martin. So following on from the chat I had with Marianne, I thought it'd be a great idea to catch up with Christine from Open Inclusion and just hear a little bit more about how Open Inclusion are going to be supporting the Valuable 500 initiative. So Christine, just to kick off, it'd be great to hear how and why you got involved and also what Open's role is going to be as well. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, really happy to to share that. We think, I mean, when I first spoke to Mary Ann Waite um, about the Valuable 500 um, campaign last year, I suppose the key thing that Valuable 500 are really pushing so hard on that we completely uh, support and agree with is that this is much easier once you've got senior sponsorship and senior mm -hmm. engagement in an organisation. And one of the real challenges lots of um, people you know, across organisations are having today is you may have one group or one, you know, one team, one individual really working to try and remove exclusion either of customers or, or in the workplace um, that's there today. But without that senior sponsorship, it becomes quite difficult. Yeah. So I love the approach. There's some fabulous people involved in it. So yes, we were very quickly um, saying we'd be, we'd be delighted to be involved. Go on, so, so the, the role, yeah, as I said, the open role as well. Yeah, so um, we're one of the, the expert partners um, that's involved in it and an absolutely fabulous group of, of other expert partners there. Um, and what we've offered to really support with is to help organisations that have signed on really know where to go next. What can they do when they're choosing which action? Because there's three things you do as an organisation for Valuable 500. You get a CEO to sign up, you commit to having a board discussion, and you commit to an action that you can deliver within the year. The CEO signing up, um, you know, is once it's done, it's done. It's quite binary. Um, once the uh, having a board discussion, it's such a valuable topic. Hopefully, you know, that all of these organisations will want to be having that board discussion across the year anyway, whether they're signed up or not. But this kind of commits them to that. But that action that's going to be a really meaningful action to the organisation and very pertinent to each organisation individually that's the bit that kind of requires some support. So that's where Open's going to support um, the partners or the people that have signed up. And what we're doing is we're sharing our customer inclusion model. So this is a model that we've developed over um, a number of years of working with organisations, consider what their customer inclusion is like at the moment and work out how to improve the spaces and environments that, that there are challenges in that we've found 
and then how to build the organizational environment so you don't just recreate those over time but actually over time it gets more and more mature and easier to create inclusive environments by design so um, that that's really the part we're supporting them with that's going to be part of the toolkit that signatories will get um, once they're signed up great so I was going to ask you about what the sort of um, the what the, the tangible things you're going to do I think really you, you've touched on that quite well we're just explaining the role but is there anything else you, you'd add to um, the, the customer toolkit that you're going to the customer model that you're going to support the businesses with yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the most useful thing is to think about the customer model. When you think about inclusion, it's quite a, a broad word and can mean different things to different people. So I love to flip it on its head and talk about exclusion. Mm -hmm. And if you think about when you've excluded a customer, that becomes kind of clearer what that is. And mm -hmm. I don't really mind why they're excluded. If you design an environment that excludes people, you're obviously not going to sell that much product or provide a great customer experience. So it's kind of looking for those moments of frictional barriers in the current environments. That's the first part. So we look across four different environments. The digital environment, which is you know, obviously increasingly important for some organizations is 100% of what they do for other organizations is a smaller percentage, but the digital environment in all its formats. Um, secondly, and it could be apps, it could be websites, it can be in-store kiosks or payment terminals or anything that's digital. Uh, secondly is the, the environment of products in the physical environment so that could be physical products such as you know clothing the things you're selling mm -hmm. um, or it could be the physical environment of say a theater or a supermarket or a, um, you know something that the customer experiences in a physical form uh, the third one is the customer service environment so anything that's to do with person-to-person -person service either face-to-face -face, or it could be things like call centers or even um, chat help if it's got a person on the end of it not an AI on the end of it mm -hmm. um, we, we kind of anything where by supporting the staff be better and more confident at dealing with people with different needs that we can improve that and the fourth one is one a lot of organizations don't really consider and that's their brand and marketing it's how mm -hmm. they position their organization out to the full customer um, environment you know, not always using whether it's at the, the what they call above the line marketing, you know, the, the advertising campaigns and the kind of glossy bit, whether it's who they use as, as their models and as the, the people involved in that um, in front of the screen, or whether it's it's the below the line marketing and just the kind of much softer stuff like their social media and how they use language and how they consider, you know, including everyone. So those are the four environments. And it's thinking through of those four environments, how are people um, performing today? And then if you find issues with those environments, which pretty well every organization has, how to work those out and there's a how to design for a specific fix to those and solution to those, um, which is really engaging people with disabilities and, and different access needs through the process. And I think that and that's a massive value that open inclusion offers, isn't it? It's that you've got the, the panel of disabled consumers who you can bring their voice to the businesses and, and connect them as well. Absolutely. And we were just talking before this, but essentially the, the power of open is our ability to connect the right community of people to the organization that needs to be able to hear that community's voice in a powerful and effective way. Yeah. And that's the easiest way to design a really you know, useful, innovative, inclusive experience is to understand a really broad range of needs right up front and get get the designers pulled by those um, in a very positive way yeah and i think the sort of words around user experience and customer experience it chimes well with businesses whereas i think in the past some of the almost similar initiatives or the, of trying to get disabled voice to be heard but it almost jarred with businesses because it sounded almost activist or negative, but in the end, it's just good design, right? It's a really good point. And in fact, talking to designers, and we spend quite a lot of our time talking to design teams and organisations, um, where one of the big fears that you hear is, is this going to be reductive? Is this going to mean I have less that I'm allowed to do? And as a designer, it's going to essentially, you know, hinder my style you know have how much I, how creative i can be 
And uh, I have exactly the opposite experience that the more people, particularly up front, engage with really wide variety of, of needs and approaches and, and diversity of, of customer types, the more creative they get and the more innovative and interesting the solutions become. Yeah. So it's actually exactly the opposite. The fear that people have when they first step into it, you see them kind of go, oh, is this going to you know, get in my way? And then as they engage and as they kind of see how co-creation and, and collaboration can really um, open their minds to ideas they never would have had, the creativity actually goes right up yeah. rather than being you know, hindered in any way. So, so, so far we've, we've got the valuable 500 and we've got CEOs signing up and all the, the great things that open can offer to help the partners and, you know, and everything in that world. What if someone watching or listening to this now is maybe not so senior and their, their business, the leadership is not yet willing or able to, to sign up? How can they maybe help positively influence that? Really good question. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is everybody in their role creates some level of environment and is involved in, in some environment. It might be a workplace environment. They might be involved focusing internally and managing a team or, or um, being involved in HR or in, in some sort of internal operational area. Or it could be external facing where they're dealing with customers or supporting teams dealing with customers. Either way, look for those spaces where there's barriers to people. Look for where there might be exclusion that until you kind of put that lens over it, um, you might not quite pick up and find those, the, the points of friction and the points of, of barrier in the experience that you're offering either to the workplace or to customers. And you don't need to take on the world, just take on one of them and start to remove it. And if we all do that every day, actually it's amazing how quickly these barriers can be, be pulled down. And what might you might see because it's a barrier to someone with a specific access need and you know maybe it's it's a wheelchair user who you know needs step free access around an environment um all of a sudden you're creating workplace environments you're creating customer environments that are, have lower trip hazards and are easy for older people to move around just have wider aisles and feel nicer for anyone who's you know feels constricted and constrained as soon as they're in a very cluttered and closed off environment so everyone will enjoy it more. So that that way that you'll find the barriers may be through someone with a very specific need, but the opportunity and the enjoyment you offer to your customers and your workforce by finding them and removing them will be much broader than that. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with that. Well, that, that brings us towards the end of the podcast. I mean, these, these two podcasts we've done on Valuable 500, it, it, what I found so amazing is the passion that's come through from Caroline to Marianne to yourself, it, it just shines out. And I think there's a real feeling of momentum with this campaign and a lot of people paying interest and paying attention. So it'll be exciting to see how it all progresses in the, in the future. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love the people involved. That's a big part of the draw for us. We are a, an organisation that collaborates. We do our thing and we do our thing very well, but we collaborate with other organisations to do the other parts of the solution. So there's many parts that you, you know, an organisation might need in order to, to change an environment fully. Um, and that's one thing I think the Valuable 500 campaign is doing a really brilliant job at bringing together great organisations right around the world that are working on different parts of, of this from their various perspectives, their various levels of expertise, their various experiences, and just working with them all um, in collaboration has been, um, you know, it's been a great experience and it is being a great experience. And for the organisations that are on the edge and wondering whether this is something for them, I mean, I think this is just such a powerful, you know, very easy to step in, but a very powerful way to, say from the top this is something that's important and as the name says you know it says on the tin what it is this is valuable not valuable you know just because it's a nice thing to have but this is valuable to our organization yeah. and um you know let's let's bring on more value to our organization who doesn't want that <laughs> awesome well thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas with me today christine and i'll catch Absolute you again. Pleasure, Martin. you have a great afternoon thanks <laughs>